Get on the most popular rides without impossibly long waits. Ride seats that give you the best views. What are the secrets only the experts know to make Disney rides even better? We've got all our greatest ride hacks for you today here on DFB Guide. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog. The DFB team is in Disney World every single day. That's not an exaggeration. We are literally there every day. So we ride a lot of rides all the time. And that means we're getting pretty good at figuring out what ride tips are the best to rely on and which ones are just internet rumor mumbo jumbo. So today we've gathered 50, that's right, the big 5-0 ride hacks that have worked for us in the past so that you can use them on your next Disney trip too. Don't worry about having to jot down any notes though. We have all these hacks already typed up for you, ready to send your way. Send us your email at disneyfoodblog.com slash 50 ride hacks. That's 50 ride hacks, and we'll make sure to get that PDF sent straight to your inbox. Okay, starting out with this first ride hack, we don't talk about this nearly enough, but it can make a huge difference for your entire Disney World trip. And that is scheduling an early breakfast at certain locations. So what do restaurants like Crystal Palace and Cinderella's Royal Table have in common besides being character dining locations? They've got breakfast reservations available before the Magic Kingdom opens each day. Yep, so while Magic Kingdom normally opens for everyone starting at around 9 a.m., these dining locations tend to have table availability starting at 8. If you happen to get your hands on one of these super early tables when the park opens at 9, a cast member will check for your reservation at the park entrance and then let you into the Magic Kingdom before everyone else. Now, I know we're talking about ride hacks here, but there's something spectacular about walking into a practically empty Main Street USA and getting a clear view of Cinderella Castle before you have to share this view with thousands of other guests. So make sure to grab a picture or two while you can. Nope, you can't just make a reservation then hop immediately onto a ride once you're in the park. You'll have to go eat first, and believe me, you're gonna want to because these restaurants are super fun. But after you're done chowing down, you can be one of the first guests to get in line for one of your most anticipated rides. Now, pop quiz, you're at Epcot just in time for rope drop. Do you get on Spaceship Earth because it's right there and super cool and convenient and it's a giant golf ball and you want to ride it? Or go deeper into the park and get in line for a ride like Frozen Ever After or Test Track, which you know will get wildly busy later on in the day. I know Spaceship Earth is beautiful and hypnotic, but do not let her pull you in like a siren and waste those precious early morning minutes on a ride that never has a long wait. Spaceship Earth's lines usually stay pretty mellow, but they're the longest first thing in the morning because a lot of people don't watch DFB Guide and they don't know that those lines are gonna be super, super low later on in the day. Just pass on right by Spaceship Earth. Go ride Frozen, Test Track, Remy's Ratatouille Adventure, one of those rides that has the longest waits all the time, and then go to Spaceship Earth around noon. She's gonna have a lower wait then. Now, I'm just gonna say this outright. If you're in line for Rise of the Resistance at Galaxy's Edge, there are no bathrooms inside the queue. Water fountains, yes. Bathrooms, no. At least not easily accessible ones. But if you've already waited a good chunk of time in the main line, enough time to have your blue milk run its course, are you doomed to have to endure this ride with a full bladder? No, when you come across a cast member in line, let them know what's up, even if they're a super scary, like first order person. They should be able to assist you toward one of the emergency exits so you can use one of the facilities backstage. This usually happens in the big stormtrooper hangar. Now, of course, you wanna take care of business before you get in line as much as you can, but we've all had those emergencies. So heads up that that could be an answer. Now, you also want to know which rides do have mid-queue restrooms, so look at Flight of Passage, which let's thank the Imagineers because they are thinking three steps ahead of everybody else. Flight of Passage is the only ride on property with a mid-queue bathroom. These single-seater restrooms can be found as you pass into the bioluminescent jungle section of the queue following the cave system waiting area. But these bathrooms are just gonna have the bare basics because you've gotta get back in line pronto. So if you're looking for a changing table or even a mirror, you're not gonna find one here. Next tip, if you arrive at Epcot in time for rope drop, good for you, you might be surprised by the way the mornings work around here. While Epcot technically opens at 9 a.m., the World Showcase doesn't officially open until 11 a.m., meaning you're not gonna be able to shop and munch your way around the pavilions for another two hours. 
But even when the pavilions are in the process of waking up in the morning, you can still experience the rides in World Showcase starting at 9 a.m. So that means you can get to the park and head straight over to Frozen Ever After in Norway or Remy's Ratatouille Adventure in France. You can also technically go straight over to Grand Fiesta Tour in Mexico as well, but this one's usually a walk-on, so you may want to hold off until you get those bigger rides out of the way first. Just don't forget about the three caballeros because they are a national treasure. Oh, and heads up, if you happen to go to Remy's Ratatouille Adventure, Léal, which is of course the bakery over there in France, also opens at 9 a.m., so that's 9 a.m. mimosas for you, my friends. There you go, you're welcome. Now, this is our first Genie Plus ride hack. Don't worry, there'll be plenty more of those to come. But one of Genie Plus's most confusing rules is also the most useful. Though you can only make one lightning lane selection at a time, you can make another one just as soon as A, you use the previous one, or B, 120 minutes have passed since you made that previous lightning lane, whichever happens first. That 120 minute rule can be essential for getting more lightning lanes in a single day. Here's an example. Let's say it's 10 a.m. and I get a lightning lane for Slinky Dog Dash. The return time I'm given isn't until 3 p.m., which is still five hours away. But because of the 120 minute rule, I can make my next lightning lane selection starting at 12 p.m., even if I haven't been able to use my Slinky Dog one yet. And that means I could be holding multiple lightning lanes at any given time of the day. This is critical and you need to learn how to use this. This is the way channels like ours and sites like ours keep you one step ahead of every other Disney guest in the parks. All right, it's super exciting when your kid finally gets to be tall enough to start riding the big kid rides, right? Then it's so much less boring to go to Disney World, but make sure you ease them into this new world of riding coasters first. Because if you take them on something like Expedition Everest right off the bat, or you're a dum-dum like me who took their two-year-old on Big Thunder Mountain in Disneyland, and we now know that coaster is the fire coaster because he absolutely freaked out and didn't ride anything else till he was five. Yeah, you, you may struggle to get your traumatized tot on anything else the rest of your trip. The three best coasters you can take new riders on that'll help them get their feet wet with more thrilling attractions are Barnstormer in Magic Kingdom. That was a big winner for us, and I know it is for a lot of you too. Seven Dwarfs Mine Train in Magic Kingdom and Slinky Dog Dash in Hollywood Studios. In that order, by the way. These rides still feature some fun turns and bunny hills, but they're not gonna take you down any major drops or send you on a zero to 60 mile per hour launch or, you know, traumatize you with dynamite. Once you test the waters with one or two of these, you can start easing them into some of the bigger thrills like Big Thunder, Space Mountain, and Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. I'd save Rock and Roller Coaster till they're a little bit older, and probably Tron too. Those two are both 48 inch height requirements though, so they kind of have to be a little bit older, unless your kid is like Shaq. All right, like I said, we're gonna have some genie talk in this video, and we're gonna explain that whole paper ride jam here because that is a ride hack, even if we don't love that we have to pay for it. It can still solve a lot of problems if you need to. There are two premium parts of the Disney Genie planning tool that you can pay to use on your My Disney Experience app. The first is Disney Genie Plus. This starts at $15 per person per day and allows you to select lightning lanes that'll bypass the main queues for many of the attractions you'll find around the parks. If you buy Genie Plus on the day of your visit, you can start making reservations one at a time, starting at 7 a.m. Once the time for that reservation has passed, you can make another and so on. And don't forget that 120 minute rule, right? The second part is the individual lightning lanes or those pay per ride features. Not every ride's lightning lane will be available through Disney Genie Plus. Instead, the newer and most popular rides you'll have to pay for a la carte. For those rides, you can book reservations individually by paying a separate fee, which always fluctuates based on the ride's predicted demand. Reservations for individual lightning lanes open up at 7 a.m. for Disney Resort guests. But if you're not staying at a Disney World hotel, you'll have to wait to get your individual lightning lane once the park officially opens for the day. There's a lot to learn about lightning lanes. We're going to talk a little bit more about them throughout this video, but if you want a more in-depth look into how Disney Genie Plus and individual lightning lanes work, check out our Outsmarting Disney Genie Plus video after this for more tips and tricks and all things Genie advice. 
Now, big news. Starting March 20th, 2023, guests who purchase Disney Genie Plus in Disney World will get free digital photo pass downloads for attraction photos taken on the day of their purchase. This includes photos at rides like Space Mountain, Slinky Dog Dash, Test Track, Expedition Everest, and lots more. So if you want to remember the absolute terror on your kids' face as they meet their very first Yeti, or if you want to forever memorialize that peace sign you're throwing on Test Track, your Disney Genie Plus purchase will make collecting these priceless memories easier on you starting March 20th. You're welcome. So very rarely are you going to find me advising you to avoid the front seat of a coaster when you can, but there are two times that you want to do it. And this is the first, Slinky Dog Dash. Listen, Slink, you're adorable, but your gigantic head blocks everything. I can't see the Toy Story Land below or the ride sets or anything really. So when you're about to board this one, let a cast member know that you'd like to avoid row one because Slinky Dog's head is giant and it blocks your view on everything. Now they'll likely be able to put you in a different seat, but once again, if the line is wild and they're just trying to keep their heads above water, you may have to sit up there with Slink. No guarantees. Now, this next one is going to help y'all who maybe have some issues with motion sickness. You're going to follow the rules for swimming on those spinny rides. You know how when you eat something, you're supposed to wait 30 minutes before you go swimming so your food can have time to settle? Yeah, copy and paste that concept, even though it's, you know, not a real thing, before you get on spinny rides like Mad Tea Party in Magic Kingdom or Mission Space in Epcot. You don't want to ride spinning rides on a completely empty stomach either, but you don't want to ride them right after you eat a giant heavy Disney World meal. Instead, enjoy a meal, take a walk, and then come back to these attractions later on. If you're sensitive to motion sickness, you may want to apply this rule to rides like Soarin' Around the World, Flight of Passage, Star Tours, and Remy's Ratatouille Adventure as well. And on top of that, make sure to pack those over-the-counter non-drowsy motion sickness meds to help settle your stomach before the attraction, and avoid queasiness post ride through. After my first couple of rides on Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind, I realized that I needed to go to first aid and get some Dramamine to get through the rest of the day. And that's fine. They do have that for you at first aid as well. Now, here's the second time I'm going to advise you to not sit in the front row of a coaster. If you are a major thrill seeker, go to Universal Studios. But if you happen to be at Disney World, then this could be your favorite Disney ride hack yet. When it comes to those coasters at Disney World, like Rock and Roller Coaster, Big Thunder Mountain, Slinky Dog Dash, you're gonna have a much more intense ride through if you're sitting in the very back row. Why? Because the first half of the coaster is yanking along the second half, making your ride through feel way more wild from the back. However, if you're with someone who isn't used to roller coasters yet or who straight up dislike more intense rides, then the closer you get to the front of the train cars, the slower things are gonna go and feel. Now, speaking of coasters, we're gonna talk about the bag trick. Backpacks and purses, super handy to have in the parks, but what are you supposed to do with them when you're on the roller coasters? Well, most of the rides do have somewhere you can keep your things stored, like a little pouch in front or to the side of you, but if you're carrying one of those heavy duty hiker backpacks, these little pockets aren't gonna do anything for you. This is where the bag trick comes into play. Once you're seated, just take the handles of your backpack and drape each one around each of your knees. And that's what you gotta do. That's it. We've never had issues with bags flying off of us before while using this method, but if you want a little bit of extra security like I do on Rock and Roller Coaster, I always loop one strap around my foot just for security. Now, if you load it up in one of the gift shops and find yourself with giant Disney bags full of goodies that absolutely will not fit in your seat compartment, let a cast member know. They might be able to hold it for you near the exit or let you take turns while another person in your party waits behind with your stuff. If you're doing several thrill rides in a row, consider investing in a locker rental. You'll find these near the entrance of the parks and near water rides like Holly River Rapids, but they will cost you about 10 to $12 extra to use for the day. All right, time for a virtual Q ride hack. You want to get on Tron Light Cycle Run at Magic Kingdom? Then you're going to have to be quick about it. Tomorrowland's new high speed coaster uses Disney's virtual Q system, which means in order to ride this thing, you'll have to enter the virtual Q through the My Disney Experience app at either 7 a.m. or 1 p.m. or get an individual lightning lane. But let's say for this purpose you want to go the free route. 
Getting your boarding group number isn't as easy as tapping a few buttons on your screen and securing your spot. Not usually. As soon as these drop times go live, they'll book up within seconds. If you so much as blink too long, you could miss your window of opportunity for these brand new rides in Disney World. But there is a way to help you speed ahead of other guests and secure your way to virtual queue victory. Beginning at 6 a.m., you can tap into the virtual queue and get your party all set up beforehand, meaning the folks you want to ride with. That way, you'll have fewer steps to worry about when you're quickly trying to tap in at 7 or 1. So on the app, under Join Virtual Queue, you'll find a button that says Confirm Your Party. Once you hit that button, the app will find the people who are linked to your account. You'll select each person that you want to add to your party and again, hit Confirm Party. Then you'll be sent to a screen that'll provide you with some more information about what next steps you'll take when those virtual queues go live. When 7 a.m. or 1 p.m. hits, you can refresh the page and click Join Queue to get a boarding pass ASAP. Every second truly counts when it comes to these virtual queues, so don't take this extra step for granted. Get it out of the way as soon as you can so you don't have to worry about it later on when time is of the essence. Because again, everybody who doesn't watch these videos is going to have to sit there and choose their party while you're already in the virtual queue. Now, the fact that Animal Kingdom is the park that closes the earliest out of the four could end up giving you the upper hand. For many folks who are using the Park Hopper add-on, they'll choose Animal Kingdom as their first park of the day. Then once their Park Hopper activates after two, they'll jump over to a park that stays open later for their second half. And hey, this isn't a bad method, especially if you're wanting to maximize your park time. But since a good chunk of people will leave Animal Kingdom after two, that means ride weights are gonna start dropping. So a ride like Flight of Passage, which could normally rack up a wait of 120 minutes plus, might actually dip to a more reasonable level if you go ahead and stick around Animal Kingdom for that three, four, five o'clock time frame. So why wait in lines during the day when you can just walk onto the rides at night? Throughout the year, Disney offers limited time, separately priced after hours events at lots of their parks. These events are capped off for a really limited number of guests, meaning lines for rides during these nighttime parties are often significantly shorter than what you're gonna find during the day. In terms of the regular after hours events, which are offered at Magic Kingdom, Disney's Hollywood Studios, and now Epcot, you'll be able to hang out in the parks three hours after they close for everyone else. With these events, you'll also get complimentary snacks like popcorn, Mickey ice cream bars, and drinks. Now, there are also themed after-hours parties like Mickey's Not-So-Scary Halloween Party and Mickey's Very Merry Christmas Party at Magic Kingdom and H2O Glow Nights at Disney's Typhoon Lagoon. These will let you not only stay in the parks for longer to take advantage of those shorter ride lines, but also you get to experience lots of extra activities and themed events taking place during these late night parties too. For the record, if you want to experience these parks during the day, you'll still have to pay for a regular theme park ticket and the party ticket, which can get rather pricey. However, you don't have to buy a day ticket to buy a party ticket and vice versa. After hours tickets also let you enter the parks three hours before the event kicks off. That way you can get some daylight park time in, see all the shows and do all the things that maybe aren't happening during after hours, regardless of whether you have a regular day ticket or not. Now, confession, the bag trick we talked about, that's not flawless. You're not gonna be able to have your bag on the new Tron Light Cycle Run coaster in Magic Kingdom, and that's because of the way the seats work. You're gonna be riding this coaster like you would a bike, meaning you won't have any room to place a bag between your legs. There is a small compartment on the top of the Light Cycle for you to store smaller items like your phone, but otherwise you're gonna have to use Tron free locker system. Before you get to the vehicle loading area, you'll be directed over to the lockers where you'll temporarily store your larger items. To open a locker, just scan your magic band or physical park ticket, and it's a good idea to remember which number locker you selected, but even if you don't, there is a little touch screen off to the side where you can scan your magic band or park ticket, and it'll remind you which locker is yours. If you accidentally put your park ticket in the locker, which yes, we have done, just track down a Tron cast member, they'll be able to reopen it for you, but you will have to describe what's inside the locker first. And if you don't have a magic band or a park ticket, Talk to a cast member as well. They will give you a little one-time use card to use as your locker opening and closing device. 
Now, another great ride hack that we love is knowing which rides aren't going to have the longer lines. These are the ones you go ride when everything else is just through the roof when it comes to wait times. Here are some of our favorite underdog rides that you can choose to go on instead of waiting hours in line for something more popular while you're waiting for those lines to die down. In Magic Kingdom, head into Fantasyland. You're going to find a handful of rides with minimal wait times, including Mad Tea Party, Under the Sea, Journey of the Little Mermaid, and It's a Small World. In Epcot, you got tons of rides that aren't going to build up too high of weights again on a normal day. This may not be the situation if you're visiting during one of those peak vacation weeks, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. Rides like Grand Fiesta Tour in Mexico, Journey into Imagination, The Seas with Nemo and Friends, and Living with the Land are easygoing and usually pretty close to being walk-ons. In Hollywood Studios, finding any rides without those hefty lines is few and far between these days, but your best chances of lower weights will lie with attractions like Star Tours and possibly alien swirling saucers. And in Animal Kingdom, ride times aren't terrible here usually, unless you're hanging out in Pandora. But if you really want a short ride line, take a journey aboard the Wildlife Express. This little train will take you to Rafiki's Planet Watch, which is a place where you can visit a petting zoo, explore the conservation station, and even sketch alongside Disney artists at the animation experience. So lots of guests still don't know about this free Disney tool, which is shocking because we talk about it all the time here on DFB Guide. But if you're a parent or guardian with younger kids that don't meet all the different height requirements, then you will need to know about the Rider Switch program. Rider Switch is a great way for a family with at least two caretakers to tag team an attraction. If there's a younger member in your group who can't or doesn't want to ride, all you have to do is request a Rider Switch with the cast member who's stationed at the entrance of the ride. It works like this. Person one can ride either solo or with the rest of their party while person number two waits with the kids not riding. Then after the first section of the group is finished, person two who stayed behind can now switch with person one without having to wait in line all over again. Person two can also bring one other guest so they don't have to ride alone. This is a solid way to make sure everyone gets to ride the attractions they want to ride that day because no rider gets left behind. Now, another great reason for rider switch is if you have a bunch of packages like we talked about before. This is especially a good way for you to be able to ride things when you're carrying a lightsaber around all day. Let's say you went to Savi's in the morning and made your lightsaber. Now you got to carry it around Hollywood Studios with you all day because it won't fit in a locker. So Rider Switch could be the answer if you want to ride some things and don't want to leave your lightsaber just sort of sitting out for everyone to check out. Now, Disney's queue lines can be deceiving. Remember those underdog rides I talked about earlier, the ones you'll normally only wait 10 to 15 minutes for, if that? Well, during busier times of the year, we've seen the very same rides have wait times that spike up so high, we could have scaled them like a mountain. Let me give you a visual representation of what Grand Fiesta Tour looked like right after Christmas on December 30th. At the start of the day, things looked pretty tame, but by 11 a.m., the line had shot up to 60 minutes. How do they even fit a 60-minute line in the Mexico Pavilion? It's not that big in the first place. By 5 p.m., the wait finally dropped down to around 20 minutes, which is still really long for this one, but way better than an hour. So here are the three things you need to take away from this hair-raising mountain climbing scenario. Number one, keep an eye on wait times leading up to your trip and find out what the average lines usually look like. That way you're not suckered into standing in line for an experience that usually has no demand. You can study the wait times on the My Disney Experience app, but we also release updated posts on our DFB site that covers what we're seeing in the parks firsthand. Second option, wait it out. Much like Grand Fiesta Tours, wait time dropped later on in the day, so will other rides that end up peaking by mid to late afternoon. In the meantime, catch a show, do some shopping, enjoy a meal, and just don't waste your entire day waiting, waiting, waiting for a ride that's going to have a line that's going to go down and be much, much, much less of a wait later on. And three, brace yourself for the busy if you're vacationing when everyone else is. This might be a good time to invest in Disney Genie Plus, which we'll talk about more towards the end of this video. Another quick note for Mexico specifically, sometimes there is a queue to actually get into the pyramid itself. That's a different queue from the Grand Fiesta Tour. So go check with a cast member and see which one is which and which line you actually have to get into. 
Our next ride hack, adopt the gamer mentality. When you board Millennium Falcon, Smuggler's Run, and Galaxy's Edge, you're not just on a ride, you're in a video game. Even more so if you've been tasked with the role of pilot. Piloting the Falcon is an honor, but it's also possibly the most stress you'll experience on a Disney vacation. The two pilots have two different controls. The pilot on the left-hand side controls whether the ship goes left or right, while the pilot on the right controls whether the ship goes up or down. Now, if you're not big on video games, then the up-down controls for the right-hand pilot could be confusing, and that's because the ship uses inverted controls. So when you pull up on the control stick, the ship's gonna go down, and when you pull down, the ship's gonna fly up. If you're nervous about potentially crashing this hunk of junk repeatedly, which I have done many, many times, so don't be nervous about it, you may be better off with the left and right piloting controls instead, where left is left and right is right and everything's the same. All right, look, we love Soren around the world over in Epcot, but she ain't perfect. If you're not familiar with Soren, this flying simulator ride uses a curved screen to help create the illusion of hang gliding without using 3D technology, and it works pretty well for the most part. But if you end up on the sides of the ride, your view might end up looking less 3D and more like you've enjoyed one too many drinks in the World Showcase, and that's because the warped screen can make images bend. like really bend. So here's how to prevent that. When you're in line, let a Soren cast member know before they assign you a row that you'd prefer concourse B. That puts you in the middle of the attraction and gives you the best immersive effects and the best vantage point for the screen. And if you want to improve your ride even further and you're not super duper scared of heights or anything, ask for the first row. The ride rows are vertically stacked, meaning rows two and three are not only lower but also have dangling feet partially obstructing their views. Requesting a certain section does doesn't mean you'll be guaranteed that section, but cast members do try their best to accommodate. You may just have to wait a little longer before you're able to board. All right, you know how I talked earlier about sitting in the back row of a roller coaster and how that can make the experience even more thrilling? Let's up that intensity just a few more notches. For outdoor coasters, you might find that you enjoy a nighttime ride through way better than a daytime one. Take Slinky Dog Dash, for example. Not only is a nighttime ride through going to help you skip over having to stand in that sweltering line during the heat of the day, which is miserable, but when you ride Slinky at night, you're going to be able to see the whole Toy Story Land area lit up with so many rainbow lights and it's amazing. You're also going to see Galaxy's Edge all lit up. It's really cool. Now for Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, you've got kind of the opposite situation, which can be just as fun. The track blends in with the night so you can't see where you're going as well, giving it more of those Space Mountain vibes. It's not as pitch black as Space Mountain, but it'll still be pretty dark and more eerie and you won't kind of know what's coming up. And with the brand new Tron Light Cycle Run Coaster, you've got the light grid you get to speed around, which won't be illuminated during the day. So if your boarding group number is telling you your return time isn't going to be until way, way, way later on, you may be way better off than you realize. The ride is definitely better at night. Next, it's obvious there are two types of people in this world, those who want to avoid facing a man-eating Carnotaurus head-on, and those who welcome the idea kindly. Now, when you're riding Dinosaur at Disney's Animal Kingdom, there'll be a moment during the end of the ride when your Time Rover will come face to face with a Carnotaurus. Spoiler alert, definitely not our dino. If you want the full impact of this rather intense moment, then you'll want to be sitting on the far right on the first row. However, if you're riding with some younger folks or people more skittish with these types of jump scares like me, then you're going to want them to be sitting on the far left in the back row. Though cast members won't always be able to accommodate these preferences, it's always a good idea to ask them before you board. They'll do their best to make sure you're happy with your ride through. And let's talk about those Disney Resort benefits and how they can help you hack rides in Disney World. If you're planning on staying at a Disney-owned hotel or an eligible Good Neighbor hotel, then you've got to take advantage of those resort benefits to maximize your ride time. There are two benefits you need to be on the lookout for. The first is that early theme park entry perk, where all Disney World resort guests can head into any of the four theme parks on any day, 30 minutes before their official opening time. And the second is the extended evening hours benefit, where deluxe resort guests and deluxe resort guests only, meaning the people spending the most money on the most expensive rooms, can stay up to two hours in select parks on certain evenings. When extended evening hours are available, they usually happen at Epcot on Mondays, Magic Kingdom on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and Hollywood Studios on Thursdays. Hollywood Studios extended evening hours are usually the most limited, so make sure to take a look at Disney World's hours and events calendar on the website before your trip to see if you can align these benefits with your visit. 
Now, if you're not planning on staying at a Disney hotel or a good neighbor hotel that'll offer you those extra park perks, that doesn't mean you shouldn't take advantage of rope drop. If you can manage it, it's still not a bad idea to get to the parks about 45 minutes before official opening time. Before the start of the day, guests will be permitted into just a small portion of the park like Main Street USA in Magic Kingdom. But the other lands will be roped off until open, and that's where the name rope drop comes from. If you're there early enough to see these ropes officially drop, you could still be one of the first in line for any particular ride. Arriving early can end up being the most beneficial for Magic Kingdom specifically, because if you aren't relying on the Disney buses to deliver you up to the front gates, you'll have to park and take either a monorail or ferry from the Transportation and Ticket Center, which will then carry you over to the Magic Kingdom. This extra journey could take up to 30 minutes or more, and that could very well eat into your ride time if you don't arrive early enough. So. If you want to get there early, 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 or for rope drop, leave your hotel about an hour and a half ahead of time, especially if you've got to manage the trams at Magic Kingdom as well. Now, I'm not backtracking here, but I am going to warn you, some rides may not always be up and running early in the morning. Take Tower of Terror at Hollywood Studios, for instance. Recently, if we've seen Tower of Terror become temporarily unavailable, it's been in the mornings more often than not. And that's because, well, Tower has had a rough go of it lately. Fortunately, it has multiple elevator shafts and now they're all working finally after lots and lots of refurb. So even if one or two have to go down, the others still can stay open, but lines might be way longer since the ride will be running at half its usual capacity. So sometimes Tower of Terror has to warm up its ghostly Twilight Zone aura before being ready to drop guests to their untimely doom throughout the day. That means when you get to the park at Rope Drop and you're ready to make a beeline to this haunted hotel, your plans might have to quickly shift to a different experience while you're waiting for this one to go back online. So be flexible. Again, make the My Disney Experience app your bestie so it can inform you right when a ride is back in business. How you find that, by the way, is going to the map of the park you're in on the My Disney Experience app. If there's a little star, that means it's down. It's gone 101. But if it has a wait time, that means it's up and running. Now here's a hack that can save you a bunch of time. There are four aerial carousels in Disney World. I'm not talking about the mermaid, I'm talking about spinny carousels. Three of them reside inside the Magic Kingdom, Astro Orbiter, Dumbo the Flying Elephant, and the Magic Carpets of Aladdin. If you're in Animal Kingdom, you've also got Triceratops Spin over there. These are basically all the same ride, even though they have different themes. So choose to go on one and skip out on the others if you're looking to save yourself some time. So which one should you choose? Well, if you're a purist, Dumbo is the obvious choice. It also has one of the coolest queue lines on property where your kids can pass the time burning energy around an indoor playground while you wait. For a more thrilling experience or maybe an adults only group, Astro Orbiter might be a better option this Tomorrowland attraction can take you up 80 feet in the air and give you sweeping views of the park. You even have to take an elevator to ride above the people mover just to reach the carousel itself. As for the magic carpets of Aladdin and Triceratops Spin, I'd say you can choose those over the others if you've got someone or multiple someones in your group who are Aladdin or dinosaur enthusiasts. They could also both have shorter wait times than the other aerial carousels because they're just not as popular. But aside from that, if you've ridden one of these, you really don't need to ride the rest. unless you've got some kind of aerial carousel completionist, then just ignore me, I guess. Needless to say, when you ride living with the land, you are not allowed to jump out of the boat and go exploring the gardens and greenhouses. But that doesn't mean you'll never have the opportunity to do so if exploring this lush environment is a dream come true for you. The Living with the Land Behind the Seeds Tour is a one-hour guided experience that lets you explore all four Living with the Land greenhouses, as well as the fish farm, to give you an up-close and personal look at the plant growing technique Disney uses to cultivate their crops. You might just get the chance to release ladybugs into the greenhouses too to encourage plant protection, and that is super fun. The tours are $35 per guest, which is actually the cheapest behind the scenes tour you're gonna find on Disney World property, but keep in mind that you'll still have to pay for the full park admission price on top of your tour cost. It's best to make advanced reservations for this tour on the Disney World website if you want to for sure experience it during your upcoming Epcot day. But you may also be able to make day of reservations or be fortunate enough to walk in when extra tour space is available. You can always check for that last minute availability in the same location that you'll check in for the tour itself on the lower level of the land pavilion near Living with the Land exit area. Okay, time to support your favorite Disney World rides. Why just ride a ride when you can wear it too? 
Hmm, that sounded better in my head. Oh well, say lovey. On the dfbstore.com website, we've got tons of different shirts featuring your favorite rides. We've got shirts for the big Thunder Mountain fans, the Mad Tea Party junkies, shirts for Figment enthusiasts. We even have shirts for retired rides like Splash Mountain if you still want to support your Frontierland pride. Each shirt comes in a variety of different styles, colors, and sizes to make sure you can have it customized just the way you like it. Head over to dfbstore.com to pick yours up. Now, our next ride hack maybe is a little bit blasphemous to some, but it's not uncommon for ride wait times to dip down during the parades and nighttime spectaculars, so we need to talk about it. If you don't mind skipping out on experiences like the Festival of Fantasy Parade at Magic Kingdom or Fantasmic in Disney's Hollywood Studios, in exchange for a more popular ride that you didn't get the chance to check out earlier on because of the super long wait, then don't look back. Get in line now and ask for forgiveness later. Besides, riding Big Thunder Mountain during the fireworks is very cool. Now, sorry, Hondo Onaka, you are great and all, but sometimes we'd rather have Chewie screaming at us during our ride through on the Millennium Falcon rather than someone we can, you know, actually understand. When you ride Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run, your default guide is set for Hondo. But if you successfully hack into the ride's mainframe, so to speak, you can replace him with your favorite lovable Wookiee. This is how it works. All six passengers must cooperate in order to pull off this hack. Before the ride starts, do not activate your position right away. It's a trap. Instead, make sure the left and right pilots push up their controls to the far left or far right and far up or down. After they do that, then they can push their activation button. Behind the pilots, the engineers and gunners need to press and hold down one of the white buttons on their console before pressing the orange activation button. If everyone does exactly what they're supposed to, then you should be able to hear the famous Chewbacca yell for the span of your flight. Now, we've got a lot of ways to skip the lines in this list, but let's be honest, you're going to have to spend some time in line when you're in Disney World, and you don't have to be bored out of your skull when you're standing in line for a ride. The Play Disney Parks app is a free app separate from the My Disney Experience app that's chock full of activities and games specific to the ride you're waiting in line for. Some games you can play solo, some you can play with a partner, and some you might even be able to play with everyone in line like you do with the Soren Challenge in Epcot. It's also where you're going to find the Star Wars data pad, which will allow you to interact around Galaxy's Edge in a whole new way. With the data pad, you can scan and collect cargo, hack into droid tech, hack the Millennium Falcon itself, translate the Aurabash language, and tune into satellite transmissions. Let the eavesdropping begin. Now, this is a test track specific hack, my friends. One of the best parts about test track in Epcot is that you can customize your own sim vehicle in the Q's design studio to pit against other riders. These vehicles will be registered to your magic band or physical park pass. Once you're in the loading station next in line, you'll have the opportunity to scan your band or pass to have your vehicle uploaded to the ride, ready to race. But don't dilly-dally. Once you're in that loading area, go ahead and scan your band or pass ASAP to get your car all loaded into the system. Because if you wait until it's time for you to board, you'll miss your chance to upload your design. The ride is still fun either way, but you'll be missing that immersive element that allows you to be a little or a lot more competitive. Here's a tip that I've personally used a lot. If you jump in line for an attraction just before the park closes, we're talking even if you only have 10 or 15 minutes to spare, you will still get to ride that ride, unless something breaks down, of course, which has to be the gamble you're willing to make if you choose this last minute strategy. Now, let's say you're about to get in line for flight of passage 10 minutes before the park closes, but the wait is still 60 minutes. There are a couple of things you need to keep in mind. First off, yes, this means you'll be riding this ride after the park closes, as long as you can enter into the queue before it closes for the night, you'll still be golden. And second, that wait time you're seeing may not even be accurate. At the end of the night, wait times are often projected a bit higher than they really are. So not only will you get on the ride, but you'll also possibly be waiting in a much shorter line to do so. Ready to ride solo? You may be more apt to say yes if you knew just how much time you could potentially save by switching yourself over to a party of one. As Amy Adams would say, you're having a me party. If you're visiting Disney World by yourself or you're traveling with a group who doesn't mind splitting up the party in order to shed some time in line, then be on the lookout for the single rider lines. These are offered at Test Track and sometimes soaring around the world in Epcot, Millennium Falcon, Smuggler's Run, and Rock and Roller Coaster in Disney's Hollywood Studios, 
and Expedition Everest Legend of the Forbidden Mountain in Disney's Animal Kingdom. These waits can wind up being a lot shorter than normal standby lines. They could even end up being shorter than the Lightning Lane queues too, and you won't have to pay a cent extra to test this theory out. Oftentimes, a single rider strategy works best on Soren, Smuggler's Run, and Expedition Everest. But there are times when test track and rock and roller coaster single rider lines can get a bit lengthy. But still worth a shot, right? So I could be wrong, but traumatizing your kid at Disney World maybe isn't on your itinerary. And if it is, well, we'll leave that for the therapist to unpack. Even if you avoid rides that you know will scare your kid, like Tower of Terror or Haunted Mansion, there are some dark rides around the parks that have unexpected scary moments that could take your kid, or even you, off guard. For example, Journey into Imagination with Figment is a colorful and cutesy and great for younger audiences ride, but it does have that suddenly loud blast at the end that could wind up being quite the jump scare. Even I cover my ears before this moment happens, even though I've been on Figment a bajillion times. The Seas with Nemo and Friends seems innocent enough, but there is that angler fish towards the beginning of the ride who suddenly swims past you out of the darkness to chase around poor Marlin, who's just trying to find his son, bless him. And despite Marshmallow from Frozen Ever After being a misunderstood ice monster, he's still pretty intimidating when you see him emerge right before that small drop at the ride's conclusion. My son always had an issue as well on Test Track where that big semi-truck suddenly blares its horn and turns on its bright lights in your eyes. That's something that I still have to warn him about when we ride. So the best way to prepare younger audiences for these potentially sinister moments is to give them a heads up. Our friends at allears.net have tons of full POV ride throughs on their YouTube channel that you and your kids can watch before your trip. That way they will know exactly what to expect when they board these rides in real life. Now, for those of you who'll be taking the Disney Skyliner from your Disney hotel over to Epcot in the morning, or for those of you staying in one of the Epcot area resorts, you are in luck. Epcot has both a front and back entrance, so there's a secret shortcut to Remy's Ratatouille adventure. For Skyliner folks or people just walking from their room to the park from the Epcot area resorts, you're gonna be able to enter through Epcot's back gate, AKA the International Gateway. The International Gateway is located between the France and UK pavilions. And if you're using early theme park entry and entering through the International Gateway, you'll be one of the first people in line for Remy's Ratatouille adventure, meaning you can skip over the massive main queues without having to get a lightning lane to do so. Perfect. Now let's talk a little bit about extended evening hours. Remember that's that perk that the people staying at deluxe resorts get to stay in the parks a couple of hours later on certain days. But don't be fooled, though most of the rides will stay open during these later times, some of them may close when the park closes, either because it's not listed as a ride that stays open or because the ride has to go down for maintenance reasons for the rest of the night. It's also important to remember that you can't completely rely on extended evening hours to get you through all the rides in one go. Two hours may be a lot of time, but if you're trying to use all that time to get on every single heavy hitter ride that you missed at, say, Hollywood Studios, because you decide to prioritize all the shows during the day instead, you might find yourself putting way too many eggs into that extended evening hours basket. So use this deluxe benefit as a way to hit up a few rides you missed earlier or to squeeze in some last minute re-rides, but don't solely rely on it to help you accomplish every ride in one night. And definitely look at that list of what's included in your extended evening hours, what rides are open, because you could be surprised by what's gonna be closed. Now, another tip for those deluxe resort guests. Surprise, 7 a.m. and 1 p.m. may not be your only chances at getting into a virtual queue for Tron. On select dates when Magic Kingdom has their extended evening hours available, deluxe resort guests will be able to request to join a third virtual queue at 6 p.m. And no, unlike the 1 p.m. virtual queue drop, you will not have to be physically inside Magic Kingdom to join the virtual queue at 6. However, you must have a valid ticket and park pass reservation for Magic Kingdom on that day or you must have a valid park hopper ticket and have already entered the park you originally made your park pass reservation for. For the month of April, extended evening hours in Magic Kingdom happen on April 5th, 12th, 19th, and 26th from 10 p.m. until midnight, while extended evening hours in May are on the 3rd, 10th, and 17th from 10 p.m. to midnight. That being said, if you're watching this video after either of those months, just keep in mind that extended evening hours for Magic Kingdom generally happen on Wednesdays. So take heed of that info and plan ahead. 
Here's just another reason why nighttime rides continue to be the bomb.com. Magic Kingdom rides like Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, and Astro Orbiter can give you a totally unique view of Cinderella Castle fireworks on display. But you'll have to time your visit just right. The nighttime spectaculars are usually only around 15 minutes long, so if you see that line for Big Thunder Mountain is pushing 30 minutes, you're probably going to miss the show. But if you were to jump in the queue 20-ish minutes before the show starts, you might just be able to pull off one of the coolest rides throughs of Bink that are mountain ever. Now let's talk about earning a high score on one of the rides where a family throwdown is imminent. Don't just ride Toy Story Mania in Disney's Hollywood Studios, dominate it. This gallery shooter doesn't just reward you with points based on luck. It's all in the wrist as well as knowing exactly which targets are going to give you the most points. Because all the different ride tricks can be rather involved, I'm just going to narrow it down to a couple of my favorite strategies that'll help you rack up major points quickly. Strategy one, knock the fox off the hen house. I know this sounds kind of mean, out of context, so hopefully no family members just now walked in on this video, but when you're in that first barn scene on the ride, shooting down the fox will reward you with tons of new high score targets targets to hit. And strategy two, get a ring tossed around all the little green aliens at the same time. Even if you're actively competing against your fellow ride partner, you'll need to work together to accomplish this. If you do, the scene will change into a robot with an open mouth that lets you shoot as many rings as possible for 1,000 and 2,000 points each. There's a good lesson about teamwork hidden somewhere in that ride secret, but I'm too busy trying to win to come up with something clever, so fill in the blanks yourself. Now, the weather forecast isn't the only forecast you need to check in Disney World. The My Disney Experience app can help you figure out what estimated crowd levels might look like for each ride on the day of your visit. Just go to the tip boards option on your app, select the park you're currently visiting, and choose the attractions and shows list. Then scroll down to the ride you want to learn more about. On the right side of the attraction, tap on the View Details link. That'll open up a new screen that'll show you a graph of what estimated wait times should look like for each hour of the day. Though these estimations are subject to change, the graph can still give you a good idea for when the queue lines are predicted to be more reasonable or to skyrocket and be at their busiest. This is, of course, all based on previous data that Disney has collected. So it's pretty valid. Now, this is a big Kilimanjaro Safaris tip that you need to know about. Kilimanjaro Safaris in Animal Kingdom is the only ride in Disney World where you're going to be able to see hundreds of living, breathing, non-animatronic animals in a single tour. But because these animals are real and not just programmed to entertain you, your ride through on this safari is going to be different every single time. If you want the best chance of seeing more animals out and about and active during your ride, avoid getting on this one during the heat of the day, because if you're feeling hot, sweaty, and miserable, so are the animals. And that means most of your ride will consist of the animals hiding out or sleeping or just avoiding the public entirely which is totally relatable in Disney World in the middle of the day. However, when it's cooler out, like in the early mornings and around dusk, you're probably going to see more animals up and roaming around. That being said, different animals prefer different times of the day, so you might see certain animals when the sun's rising and completely different animals when the sun's setting. And then there are some animals who love the rain, so if you know things are about to get drizzly, then you know which ride you can turn to next. Now, I know you don't want to hear this, but refurbishments happen way too often in the Disney World bubble. Here's the good thing, though. They're almost always announced well before they actually happen. If you don't visit the parks often, or maybe you're about to go on your very first trip, make sure that the ride you're desperately anticipating will be open and waiting to meet you. You can check the refurbishment schedules on the Disney World website, and we'll keep you posted, too, on our newsletter. If you send us your email at disneyfoodblog.com slash 50 ride hacks, we'll not only give you the full PDF of this entire list, but we'll automatically sign you up for that newsletter, which is absolutely free free. And this is going to keep you in the know when it comes to all things Disney announcements, updates, refurbs and closures, and everything else. The Walt Disney World Railroad is a chill way to explore the Magic Kingdom from the comfort of your train car, and we are so glad that it's finally back and running. But not every time is train time. If you happen to be riding this locomotive during the Festival of Fantasy Parade, there's a good chance you might be stopped in your tracks, literally. The train will have to stop at Main Street USA to let the parade cross through backstage, and that takes a solid 15 minutes. The Festival of Fantasy Parade takes place in Magic Kingdom twice daily at 12 p.m. and 3 
3 p.m., though show times are always subject to change. If you don't want to potentially get stuck on your train ride, try to avoid getting in line around these times. Unless that is you want to get stuck to give your feet an even longer break, as well as catch the tail end of the parade while you're at it. Now you've already learned how to score big on one Toy Story gallery shooter, so why not learn how to master another? Buzz Lightyear's Space Ranger Spin in Magic Kingdom is wanting you to rack up big points to become a galactic hero. But in order to accomplish that, you need to know where exactly the targets with the highest points are hiding out on this ride. So here are the three targets you need to be on the lookout for. Number one is located in the first room. See that giant robot? Trust me, you can't miss him. Aim for the targets inside its arms to earn 100,000 points. Target two can be found when you're going through the star tunnel. Try to hit the body of the spaceship for another 100,000 points. And target number three is on Zerg's ship. There is a target on the bottom of his ship that you'll want to hit that's worth 25,000 points. Now there are a ton of different strategies out there to help improve your Space Ranger spin score, but if you do reach the ranks of Galactic Hero, don't forget to pick up your Galactic Hero sticker from a cast member in the gift shop at the exit. You can either wear that sticker for the rest of the day to let everyone else know how awesome you are, or you can preserve it and like frame this major reward when you get home or something, whatever, we won't tell. Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway is an adorable and very chaotic trackless dark ride in Hollywood Studios with a pretty straightforward story for the most part. During the pre-show, you'll learn the basic premise. Mickey, Minnie, and Pluto are on their way for a nice and relaxing picnic getaway at Runamuck Park, but things get a little chaotic when engineer Goofy shows up. As Mickey and Minnie cross over the railroad tracks, Pluto and their picnic basket get launched out of the convertible and subsequently, a cream pie lands in the steam engine smokestack, because of course it does. This causes Goofy to lose control and the train comes crashing into the station located just beyond the movie screen. When you're on the ride, Goofy's engineer shenanigans continue to spice things up. After he accidentally hits the track switch, all of the locomotive's train cars are sent off on their own individual paths. But let me slam on the brakes for just a second here, because if you're following along with Mickey and Minnie during the entire ride, you're going to completely miss out on the plot B taking place, which stars Mickey's bestest pal. Remember how I said Pluto and the picnic basket get chucked from the convertible during the pre-show? During the ride, Pluto has made it his ultimate mission to reunite Mickey and Minnie with the basket full of goodies, which proves to be quite the undertaking just goes to show that Pluto continues to be the goodest boy in the Disney universe. All this to say keep your eyes peeled for our yellow dog friend while you're on the ride. You can see him in each ride scene, so each room. That way you can get a whole other side of this rather wacky story. Now, this next one isn't a ride hack per se, but it's something important you'll want to know about if you or someone you're traveling with will need additional assistance in your group. Disney's Disability Access Service, or DAS, is available for guests with disabilities that'll prevent them from getting on rides due to not being able to stand in the queues for extended periods of time. Here's how they work. Guests may register for DAS before their trip between two and 30 days ahead of their park visit. Once acquired, guests can start booking attraction return time if you sign up for a DAS ahead of your visit, you may book up to two one-hour return windows before your vacation. These two pre-arrival reservations are in addition to the return times you can book throughout your park day, too. You can also register for DAS on the day of your visit by going to guest relations at the front of the park. When your ride return window comes around, you'll show your DAS pass to a cast member at the front of the attraction, and they'll direct you through an alternative entrance for boarding. And our next tip is for those planners in the group. There may come a time when one of your lightning lanes clashes with one of your advanced dining reservations. And if that happens, prioritize the dining reservation. Why? Well, there are a few reasons. First, if you don't show up to your ADR and you didn't cancel at least two hours before your reservation time, you'll be charged a $10 per person no-show fee. Meanwhile, if you miss your lightning lane return time, that's not gonna cost you anything except maybe your pride. Reason two, restaurants will try to hold your table at least 15 minutes after your return time if you're running late, but otherwise, you're gonna lose your reservation slot completely and have to pay that no-show fee. For lightning lanes, you can usually talk to a cast member at the front of the attraction, explain the situation, and they'll more than likely be able to let you use your lightning lane anyway. Just try to get there as soon as possible. Don't take advantage of the opportunity. And reason three, it's way easier to modify a lightning lane. If you find a different return time on your My Disney Experience app that works way better with your schedule, you have the option to modify your lightning lane to this new time slot, and it won't even reset your 120-minute countdown. 
So prioritize your dining reservation and understand that it's not a guarantee that you'll be able to ride the lightning lane, but most of the time cast members are able to make it happen. All right, we did it. You're now officially equipped with 50 different ride hacks that you can use for your Disney World vacation. You should feel like a pro. 50 may seem like a whole lot of ride tips and tricks, but we're not done with all the ride advice yet. Keep checking back here with us for even more ride news, recommendations, and tips to come. And remember to drop us your email at disneyfoodblog.com slash 50, that's 50, ride hacks to receive our entire ride hacks digital download, which you can refer back to when you're looking to impress your friends and family, of course, or just print it out and bring it in the parks with you. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.